So the application of AI um, in business, industry, government, healthcare environment is the next panel. I will start off with a few examples of um, some of the research that we have been doing at Humane, um, starting from space applications. Uh, in the uh, past six to seven years, through multiple different projects funded by NASA, uh, we flew the first uh, artificial intelligence software to International Space Station. All hardware was built by University of Maine students. Uh, they were all tested by NASA and flight certified by Boeing. Uh, we launched this to a space to find um, tiny leak locations inside International Space Station by listening to the ultrasonic sounds. Uh, one postdoc, two PhD student, two master's students, uh, several publication invention disclosure came out of this. So uh, the point I want to make here is that uh, solving problems is one part of the AI work that we are doing here, but the most important mission at the University of Maine is to actually educate the workforce and educate the students for the next uh, phase. So looking at the next slide, um, we look at the healthcare applications. Uh, University of Maine, in collaboration with uh, a startup company, uh, a spin-off out of UMaine, Activos Diagnostics, and Northern Light Health, uh, one of the largest uh, healthcare systems in Maine, have been working on using artificial intelligence for uh, detecting Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. So recently, after almost a decade of prototype development, the past two years, we have um, had the National Institute of Health uh, contract. Uh, we tested 100 patients uh, with mild cognitive impairment, uh, pre-Alzheimer, and maybe a little bit deeper into Alzheimer's disease with uh, wireless sensors embedded into their mattress pad. So it was a home care sort of technology that was being tested on 100 patients, trained the system by uh, physicians at uh, Northern Light Hospital. And we were very uh, excited to see over 95% accuracy when the AI can detect uh, things in your uh, sleep pattern that relates to Alzheimer's disease. Next slide is an application of uh, AI in environmental uh, scenarios. This is a new project uh, funded last year. In the next three to four years, we're going to uh, build and um, instrument the forest uh, ecosystem with uh, different kinds of sensors for measuring soil moisture, measuring a snow depth, measuring uh, carbon cycle and all that. And the AI here will help us in two different ways throughout the year to be able to actually create wireless sensor networks that can operate throughout the entire year not just for a few months uh, because of the inefficiency in the wireless channel. We also provide this data to the foresters for monitoring the forest ecosystem. This is a National Science Foundation project in collaboration with the School of Forest Resources, University of New Hampshire, and University of Vermont. And the next uh, slide uh, basically talks about uh, business and industry application. We are working with a main based industry uh, company called LDE Electronics that has one of the largest contracts with quick service restaurants. And we are trying to help them with building multi-type sensor networks that they can detect uh, with much higher accuracy than current systems, uh, the cars and different kind of uh, trailers and um, uh, cars coming in the drive-through of different restaurants. And we are going to apply the same methodology for automobile detection for um, uh, self-driving cars, etc. So I don't want to take too much time. I just want to uh, kind of give you some overview of things that are going on at UMaine in the past decade or so. It's applied AI in electrical and computer engineering department. And without further ado, I would like to pass uh, the mic to our first panelist, uh, Dr. Kay Aiken, co-founder uh, and CEO of Introspective Systems, to talk about her exciting research. Kay, take it away. Um, I don't think my video is on yet. By the way, Ali, thank you for the promotion, but I am one of the few non-PhDs here. I have a Bachelor's of Engineering in Energy Systems. Um, so I'm going to do a really quick summarization uh, of research that was mostly funded by the Department of Energy, but also uh, a foundation in Israel called the Berg Foundation, which is a joint uh, collaboration between U.S. companies and Israeli companies. Next slide. 
So a lot of uh, talk, talk has been about uh, most of this world wanting to get to renewable energy. Um, Maine is now has an initiative by Governor Mills to by 2045 to be 100% renewable. And that's just not 100% renewable in the, my video is apparently not working, thank you. <laughs> um, is 100% 100 renewable in across the entire energy use. So that is including the electrical system, transportation, process heat, and space heating for our homes and businesses. This is actually making uh, the uh, electrical infrastructure very, very complex. And one of the ways we can solve this problem is using artificial intelligence. The work we're doing with the Department of Energy is to design a new architecture that can be rolled out in the entire United States. Um, the advantages to it is if you try to do a centralized system uh, you would end up with so many separate agents, so many uh, individual nodes that you would have to control that the computing power required would be astronomical and would be unable to be able to uh, solve the problem. So we've actually building an architecture using artificial intelligence to split the grid up into many, many small cases. So you can think of one small um, area would be your house and then the next area would be your neighborhood, and the next area would be from your substation down, and then it would be a part of the state, and then the entire state. And this is actually how uh, ecosystems work. Ecosystems are all autonomous individual agents that work together to solve a global optimization pro uh, problem, and that is uh, living. So the idea is biomimetic, it requires distributed intelligence, and in this case, distributed AI um, has uh, aspects of being adaptive, just like an ecosystem, and is also fractal, in other words, multiple layers. Next slide. So the biggest problem in this area is how do you coordinate the control? How do you not have runaway conditions uh, working across uh, uh, the entire system? Um, some people might remember the 2003 uh, blackout in New York City over most of the Northeast, where a single one error caused a blackout over uh, 10 or 12 states. So what we've done is actually use, brought two areas together, control theory and economics into one uh, type of algorithm that is able to use market-based constructs, market-based economics to actually manage the flow of ener energy. And this idea uses the sub-optimization of breaking the electrical grid up into multiple layers and then pricing gateways that actually price power um, at the local area based upon the scarcity or uh, uh, amount of power that's available. Next slide. Very quick review. Some of the control theory people will recognize this. This is actually called the Bellman equation. Um, this is a subset of that um, using um, uh, the idea of adaptive dynamic programming, which was formed early in the uh, 1980s. Our particular uh, special sauce is we have both online and offline learning that are continuing to learn and evolve on the grid as they're working. Uh, this class of, of algorithms are very, very good at solving multidimensional problems that are up till now have been unable to be uh, solved. Um, one of them is a, is, a, is a prime idea that a lot of AI researchers have, have talked about is the traveling salesman problem of, of having a hundred places to stop at and finding out what the quickest route is to, to do that as quickly as possible. This is actually a very, very hard problem to solve. And these classes of algorithms have uh, worked on solving those. This form of ADP allows the consistency and allows the system to evolve as needed as time progresses. Next slide. This is actually a real world example of the research. Um, some of you might have heard about a microgrid being developed on the Isle of uh, Idaho. And uh, in that case, where we're using a 300 kilowatt solar array, a one megawatt hour storage uh, facility, a, a battery, 
as well as 20, over 20 heat pumps that actually help balance the grid. And what is driving the decision making for those devices is actually a price signal. And that price signal prices power at the, at, in real time using AI um, to try to balance the system so there's enough power at all times. So when, when power is scarce, consumption will go down, heat pumps will start turning off, and production will go up. In other words, the battery will provide more power. And when power is abundant, consumption will go up, basically shifting the power use to a different time, and, and production will go down. So I'll have that, and we'll go with the questions. Thank you very much, Kay, for uh, presenting this uh, slide. So let's move on to the next uh, presenter. Um, Dr. Sepide Panavati is assistant professor at the uh, School of Computing and Information Sciences at UMA. Sepide, please. Hi. Um, so I um, we have a, a privacy engineering regulatory compliance uh, lab, Percy Lab at UMaine, that we deal with different aspects of uh, protecting privacy of individuals at the age of AI. Um, and uh, we deal with uh, basically uh, making sure that the uh, applications they don't collect and use or um, process personal information without the user's consent. Next slide. So uh, one of the uh, uh, um, advancement of AI is that like mobile applications, they collect lots of uh, massive amount of information from the users and they process those data. Um, and lots of times they might violate privacy of uh, um, individuals. Um, and for example, um, they might collect, uh, record the audio without the permission, or they might, for example, collect a collection uh, location without like you even know it. And uh, what we are doing at Percy Lab, we try to solve like, these problems of protecting personal information, uh, even though the applications use and process those uh, information for their purposes. Next slide. However, um, protecting personal information is not easy. One of the factors is that governments uh, impose laws uh, on developers that they need to give notices to the individuals that what are they collecting, what they're doing, and uh, how their applications are using these data. Uh, to create these type of notices, um, you need a lot of efforts because at, um, first of all, you need to have some legal backgrounds and getting legal experts are very expensive. Uh, the applications, they constantly updated, the laws are also getting updated. And um, it's not very easy for uh, developers to match their application behavior with um, with what uh, actually they give notice to the user. And uh, in Percy Lab, we try to resolve these problems by uh, developing some frameworks that um, basically tries to, instead of um, just like writing uh, privacy notices, tries to translate directly uh, what happens in the applications into natural language um, statements related to privacy. So instead of that, dev developers use some privacy generators that uh, they just create inconsistent and generic application, we try to resolve this problem. Next slide, please. And um, one of the projects that we have is uh, basically developing a recommender system that goes from the uh, code segments of the applications into some statements like uh, what you see on this slide is just very simple statements that the users and uh, the developers, they will understand. Next slide, please. And uh, as I said, for this, we are using the AI techniques and we are also protecting the data. So the advancement of AI, we're still protecting the users so that they have both of the balance between uh, getting benefit from the um, techniques that AI offers and also protecting their uh, individual privacy. Um, next slide. So um, we have like several projects, like uh, one of them is related to Android application. We are also dealing with Internet of Things and blockchain to protect the individual's privacy in, in healthcare, in, uh, in smart home environment. And we are also looking at the regulations uh, to make sure that these privacy statements are also compliant with the uh, regulations and uh, we have four phases for this project and several of our um, PhD students and undergraduate students are dealing with uh, this project. Next slide. 
so the con uh, main contributor at the moment of the project are um, the uh, senior privacy research scientists from Google. We have two PhD students involved in the project and several undergraduates are also working uh, to develop uh, such application to protect individuals' privacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, so next uh, panelist is Dr. Tim Liu, Harold Alphon, Associate Professor of Business Analytics from Maine Business School. Tim. Thank you, Ali. Uh, I would like to add some uh, comments on this uh, important topic from the business perspective in two different aspects. One is uh, business application of AI and the other one is the philosophy of using AI in business. So first, at uh, the application side, we can classify in a general sense all AI business applications into three categories and each serves a specific objective. So first is a rule-based machine learning to support high-level business decision making using transparent and accessible uh, algorithms like uh, regression or tree-based algorithms that require significant human intervention. So here uh, it is very important to point out that the rule refers to business rules, not any mathematical rule. And secondly, we have a purely data-driven machine learning to efficientize low-level business op process using neural networks or deep neural networks based algorithm that depends less or little human intervention. And the third is the automation to optimize business operation and the production by replacing human labor with robotics. I believe the most recent example is automation in meat uh, processing. And at uh, the philosophy side, uh, I believe the fundamental reason that AI technologies are playing and will play much more enhanced roles in business is because we are in the so-called third AI wave. The key feature of the third AI wave is that it is powered by high performance computing infrastructure and big data. So because business is actually all about human behavior, which is probably the most important lesson we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic. So in business environment, it is not really about artificial intelligence at all. It is really about collective intelligence of human and machine. So the, for example, human is better at the thinking and the perceiving and machine is better at predicting and recognizing. So there are two key questions for anyone who wants to introduce AI technology into their business. One is what work should machine do and what work should a human do? So the other question is how to optimally integrate the human work with the machine work together. So it is a, widely agreed in business researcher community uh, conceptually to serve the three different types of applications of AI in business. AI can play the role of tool, assistant, peer, and manager. So essentially what we really want in business is a bi-directional relationship between human and the machine so that machine can better support or manage, manage human work and the human can make machine work better. So that is all for me today. Back to Ali. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Arup Ganguly from Northeastern University, Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, Arup? Thank you very much. I think my video needs to be started from uh, the host site. Um, Tilan. Okay. Um, thank you. All right, so uh, once again, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I am um, 
at Northeastern University, where I lead the Sustainability and Data Sciences Laboratory. I'll talk a little bit about what research we, we do there. Uh, in terms of this particular panel, uh, one of my former PhD students has started this uh, climate risk analytics company, which focuses on um, uh, climate change adaptation through data analytics and AI, uh, especially in the urban sector. This started as an NSF uh, SBIR uh, project, and then um, now uh, it has been embedded within one large exchange. So uh, with that, if you could move to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So uh, yes, thank you very much. So uh, the case I was trying, uh, I'm trying to make here is that when you think about climate, when you think about the science of climate and the adaptation and the implications, we are talking about um, inherently coupled uh, complex systems. So here is just one example uh, from uh, the country where I was born and grew up in, which is India, where uh, you know um, there's a lot of dependence on the monsoon. So in 2012, there was delayed monsoon and um, extreme heat waves, which together caused a surge in agricultural water demand. And because of various policies that have been put in place with, with all good intentions, but then the way they sometimes work, they have unintended consequences. So there's uh, an extreme surge in agricultural water demand, as well as electric pumps that were put in place. And that led to increased stress on the power grid. Uh, and what that caused is the 2012 India blackouts, which is the largest blackout ever in terms of population impacted. And that in turn, because of the way the power system impacts railways, that in turn, uh, or signals and systems, that in turn impacted one of the major lifelines of India, which is the railway network. So right here we have going from uh, the natural system of climate and weather and monsoon and connecting with both policy and human behavioral issues in terms of surge in agricultural water demand, use of electricity, and then going to engineered systems, basically power grid and railway networks. So just shows how interconnected we are when you think about climate and, and adaptation. If we go to the next slide, please. So the kind of work we have been doing then is, uh, in the con uh, is uh, on the climate side, use of machine learning for weather extremes and on the engineering and infrastructure side, the impact side, looking at critical urban lifelines, interconnected critical urban lifelines, the one common theme is what some people have called domain aware machine intelligence. So in the climate side with, with complex spatiotemporal systems, we have been looking at physics guided machine learning. And with critical infrastructure side, we have been looking at network science and engineering, which are informed by novel insights and principles from engineering and policy. So broadly, the theme here is machine intelligence, but which are domain aware. If we can go to the next slide, please. So one work that we have also done is, uh, uh, I mean, we have been working uh, with the city of Boston, Climate Ready, Boston Report, the last version, some of the uh, my PhD students right now are working with the next version of that report. We have worked with the town of Brookline, Mass, in dealing with public health impacts of urban heat waves, looking at risk, exposure, vulnerability, as well as looking at adaptation and mitigation aspects. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. And we have also looked at climate risk in, in uh, urban areas with, uh, you know, for example, looking at sea level rise and what that means in terms of urban floods and then connecting that with assets at risk and looking at recovery models with network science, such as um, after Sandy in New York City, how did the New York City MTA, the mass transit, recover? And what could have been done in terms of systematic recovery principles? This was an article that we published in Climate 2020. It's the United Nations Association report. If we go to the next slide, please. These are all the students and postdocs who have helped in many of these efforts. Thank you very much. Ali, over to you. Thank you very much, Arup. So at this point, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, so I would like to ask all the panelists uh, in this 
panel to turn on your videos and unmute yourself. And I'm going to go over the Q&A um, uh, service to see what kind of questions we have. So the first question um, that uh, is coming from Carissa from uh, University of Maine. She's asking that what sort of resources will be available moving forward for labs that want to apply neural networks? Um, I can answer this question. Um, there is uh, a plan to basically have a series of seminars related to different aspects of the AI and machine learning and uh, application and theory side that we talked about today in the fall. Um, so we'll get much more deeper into these um, in future. Um, so, and I would also recommend to reach out to any of our panelists uh, in this webinar to start, uh, you know, forming collaborations uh, like that. So I'm going uh, down the list for, for the question. I have a question for Kay. Um, how does decentralizing the grid affect susceptibility to cyber attacks or natural disasters? Kay? Um, that's a good question. So one of the innovations that we're doing with our transactive, with the term we use is transactive energy, which is the idea of using economic systems to manage the grid. In our case, uh, the system is naturally cyber secure, uh, not only because it's fractal where uh, particular, it's called encapsulation in the computer industry where you can actually uh, isolate parts of the grid from the other parts, but also in our particular algorithms, we strictly use a downward facing pricing signal. So a price is sent from an upper node to a lower node and all it does is say, right now the price of power is 12 cents a kilowatt. There is no upward communication. So that makes the system very, very secure. It does make it a little more fragile. In other words, if you do have cascading, um, it can propagate, but we, the idea of fractalizing the grid uh, mitigates that problem. So it's an idea of uh, uh, win reward, uh, rewards versus uh, penalties, and you try to balance that. Thank you very much, Kay. Uh, so next question is from Eileen uh, from Maine Geospatial Institute. Uh, so the question is that what are some other methods being used to build Maine's resource network to help us all tap into available expertise for shared projects and programs. Uh, so anybody want to take that? Um, so I will uh, try to kind of briefly answer this, um, at least from uh, University of Maine or no point, we have uh, created uh, UMaine AI initiative. Uh, so we have a website that basically lists all the faculty who are involved in this research, all different projects, and um, we'll definitely uh, be happy to serve as a hub for this. And of course, there is, um, I think, a lot of activity also happening um, at the main business school that uh, Dr. Liu also mentioned. And I think, Tim, can, can you also comment on how your uh, business uh, sort of connections with the main businesses can help people get connected to the network? Uh, so actually currently in, this, uh, in our main business school, we have recently uh, added one new concentration in business analyticals into our MB program. And uh, we are also in the process of proposing a new master of science program uh, in business analyticals. And we are also uh, we are actually cl uh, closely uh, working with a couple of local uh, business in Maine uh, to build the pro two programs. Uh, for example, I have been working uh, working with uh, ILLB and the Bangor Savings Bank to provide uh, opportunities for current and future students, uh, like uh, internship and all uh, some real business projects provided by these two uh, companies. So we will have a lot more to do in future. 